Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Ron Smith. I'm Vice President for Research, Dean of the Graduate College, and Brookings Mountain Institute uh, reports uh, through our office, although they operate fairly much as an independent entity. Uh, I welcome you all. This is a very, very special night in the life of UNLV. Uh, one month ago, President Neil Smastrick announced a groundbreaking partnership with the Brookings Institution to create Brookings Mountain West. And the purpose of the new initiative is to connect research being done locally and regionally on the issues facing the Intermountain West and the national and international research that Brookings is so well known for. Specifically, Brookings Mountain West builds upon the Brookings Metropolitan Policy Program, which focuses on helping metropolitan areas like Las Vegas grow and be robust, inclusive, and do so in a sustainable way. One of the key players in the Metropolitan Policy Program is Dr. Rob Lang, currently the director of the Metropolitan Institute at Virginia Tech, a non-resident fellow with Brookings. We, are, we at UNLV are fortunate to have Rob join us as a permanent faculty member in January, this coming January, as a professor of sociology and as research director of Brookings Mountain West. Rob will work closely with his co-research director, Mark Miro, who is based in Washington, D.C., to continue researching issues they highlighted last year in a significant work called Mountain Megas. The next step in the Mountain Mega study will be to follow through on impacting so, <coughs> excuse me, actual federal and state policies and ensuring actions that take place in the five-state region of Nevada, Arizona, Utah, Colorado, and New Mexico what, in fact, the Mega Mountain study predicted in the future to be the next heartland of America. To begin this dialogue, Brookings Mountain West will convene a high-profile conference with the governors, the senators, and the key university leaders of these states sometime during the next year. It should be a, a wonderful event. Tonight, we are here to inaugurate another key element of Brookings Mountain West, our partnership with Brookings is allowing us to bring to our community and region more directly the perspective of their experts, their senior fellows, on domestic and international economic policy, foreign policy, and governance. Ten Brookings scholars will visit our campus. There will be a total of 20 visits to UNLV this year and this year alone to deliver lectures, conduct research, and network with our faculty, our students, and our community leaders. In a few moments, you will be introduced to tonight's speaker by Associate Professor Brad Wimmer from our Department of Economics. One of the many benefits of the visits of Brookings Scholars is that it is giving our faculty members an opportunity to interact with them both academically and socially. For each visitor, we are selecting two faculty members who serve as Brookings faculty liaisons and also one to two graduate students to assist them as Brookings graduate liaisons. These faculty and students serve as hosts for the duration of the scholars' visit to UNLV. They set the schedule for the scholars, set up seminars for UNLV faculty and students, and introduce them to members of the Las Vegas community who can assist them in gaining insight on the problems facing Nevada. I would like now to ask Brad Wimmer, Pushkin Kashru of our Transportation Research Center, and graduate students Alan Sanders and Naveen Shlayan to stand and be recognized for their participation as our first liaisons. <laughs> and before we move on to the introduction to tonight's speaker, I have just a few housekeeping reminders. Our next scholar is already probably on the plane and on his way, because he'll be visiting next week, Dr. Charles Ebinger, Director of the Energy Security Initiative at Brookings, will give his public lecture, Geopolitics of Global Change, the Melting of the Arctic, just one week from today, on Wednesday, October 14th at 5.30, same location, Wednesday, October 14th at 5.30. We hope you'll be able to come back for that lecture, as well as all of our future events. And as the Brookings Scholar Lecture Series gets underway, we want to be sure that you sign up to receive our emails so that you know about our upcoming events and other activities. Outside the entrance, you will find the sign-up sheet. If you've not signed that, please do so, that you, so that you can be placed on our mailing list. 
So, uh, indeed, this is an honor for me, uh, this whole event tonight. Uh, I'm happy as a clam about it, actually. So, without further ado, let me welcome Dr. Brad Wimmer to the stage to introduce tonight's Brookings Scholar. Brad, come on up and, and do your thing. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Uh, it's my pleasure tonight to introduce Dr. Clifford Winston. Uh, Dr. Winston has served as a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution uh, since 1984 in the Economic Studies program. Uh, Cliff is an applied microeconomist who specializes in uh, industrial organization, regulation, transportation issues. I'm, I'm very pleased to welcome him here tonight. He's, uh, I've, I've, I've been a uh, reader of his works for a number of years, and uh, he's, he's an excellent economist. He's uh, the co-editor of the annual microeconomics edition of Brookings' paper on economic activity. Uh, he's a prior, prior to his fellowship at, at Brookings, he was an associate professor in the Transportation Systems Division of MIT's Department of Civil Engineering. He's uh, well-written. He's uh, author of numerous books and articles. Most recently, on the topic he's going to be speaking tonight, a book called Government Failure Versus Market Failure. Uh, he's also published in a number of excellent economic journals, the American Economic Review, Econometrica, pretty much a who's who of the uh, economics literature. Dr. Winston received his A.B. in economics from University of California at Berkeley. His Master of Science from the London School of Economics and his PhD from UC Berkeley in 1979. I'd like to please help me welcome uh, to our stage our first Brookings Scholar, Dr. Clifford Le uh, Winston. Thank you. Thanks, Brad. Thank you very much for having me. I'm delighted to be here. You're talking about the benefits that you're going to get. Well, I anticipate equal benefits, certainly, in uh, discussing things with you and engaging in research and debate and what have you. I must confess, I did not prepare this lecture just now or even just in advance for this. I've been working on this for quite a while. Let me get it going. And it wasn't this before. It's evolving. Uh, it, it was the, initially the title of my book, Government Failure Versus Market Failure. And I think one of the things that's fun for me to do is allow this to evolve as the world changes. And as you now see, we've had an economic crisis and concerns now about markets and more active government and the justification for that. So this gives me an opportunity to try to update my thinking about this and run it by you and see how it goes. OK. so that. that pretty much how I'm going to see it. Now, let me just quickly say, uh, I like this room. It reminds me of a room once I, I gave a lecture in at Wharton. And what worked there could work here. Uh, I don't really feel generally comfortable like talking for an hour nonstop. I'm just not used to doing that. Uh, so if anybody really actually has questions and wants to sort of get things going early, uh, feel free to do that. I mean, obviously, you can wait to the end. But if I say something you really want to react to, I have no problem with doing that in real time. OK, so feel free to interject. And give me about five minutes, at least, to get going. All right, so with that, um, uh, let me put this a, a little bit in, in perspective uh, before going into the details of this to give some more context about what I mean by uh, assessing the crisis, and more particularly markets and government. OK, government intervenes in economic life for three reasons. Okay. First, stabilize the macroeconomy. So all the things you're hearing about now with the major monetary and fiscal uh, actions are designed to stabilize the economy, prevent the free fall, what have you. Okay. So that's the first reason for intervention. Second one is prevent what we call or correct what we call market failures. And that's really what I'm going to be talking about. Now, market failures have a very specific meaning to an economist, usually we think of market failures as producing inefficiencies. Okay, what's an inefficiency? Well, inefficiency is a case when you can sort of reallocate resources in a way that would make people better off, but not hurt anybody. Right? Now, it seems kind of dumb. How could that ever happen? And, well, it really doesn't. Um, but that gives you at least some way to start thinking about it. What happens in reality is, you can reallocate resources in a way to make some people better off and potentially compensate those who are worse off. And on net, you're ahead. Okay? 
And so when we are in those kinds of situations, we have potential market failures. And the government's job is to intervene and try to correct those failures. So we actually then continue to move resources in a good way to create basically our standard of living. All right, so market failures are, are really that part of it. Now, the third one, which sometimes gets mixed with this, is to pursue what I would call social goals. All right, so there's nothing fundamentally wrong with market efficiency, but you don't like the outcome. That is, the outcome may be some people are poor. All right, markets are efficient, people are paid properly, but you know, given their skills and, and what have you, you know, they're paid below what we thought of as an acceptable um, earning wage, and we want to do something about that. So a social goal may be to reduce poverty in the United States. Or things are efficient, but they have bad luck. They lose their job, and we want to provide some sort of social insurance. Okay? So what we're talking about there, then, is the government trying to pursue social goals, all right? But even there, we want to at least try to do that in an efficient way, and we want to minimize the cost of that. Those are the three things that we're talking about. And the things that I've been interested in really since pretty much I've been doing economics is, well, how's government doing at all this? Do we have any idea? Do we have a sense about successes and failures? Does government learn? And can we sort of build on the record to try to do better in the future? Okay. Now, macro can be a difficult topic. Even macroeconomists don't agree what the standard should be. So let me just get out of that right now. I'm not a macroeconomist. <laughs> You know, good luck uh, if you want to <laughs> get in that line of work. Yeah. Eventually, there may not be macro, as micro just sort of mushrooms and sort of says, look, let's focus on micro issues. I'm going to focus on market failure, and that's what this is really going to be about. It, it, the book initially just tries to put the evidence together. What do we really know about how governments perform? In the background, though, there'll be the social policy issues. A lot of people from Brookings are concerned with that. They'll come here. Okay, but I'm not going to focus on that, but you can raise it, and I'll then tell you what I think, which is more like a layperson than an academic. But market failure, I'll be more serious about, since I know a little about that. All right, now, the heart of all of this, though, is really the basis to try to have a scholarly perspective. All right, that given that the foundation for so much of this work is policy, it's natural that politics are going to enter into it. And when politics enter into it, I assure you the science is going to be out of it. But we're presumably doing this you know, to try to pursue truth. And there is such a thing as truth. You know, the media may not believe that, but there really is such a thing as truth. It's not everything is just a debate. Um, and we want to learn and build from it. And so what I really want to try to focus on is the scholarly foundation for trying to develop our thinking and how we seriously assess government. Now, you may predictably interpret me as sounding conservative, I assure you, politics have nothing to do with it. My voting record would really surprise you, despite how you think I'm going to sound. All right, this really is about economics, okay? All right, so I'm on now. You can have anything in terms of questions or observations. I have no problem with that. All right, great. So, okay, now, as I said, so what we want to be doing is trying to get some sort of scholarly empirical foundation and I mention a word there that's extremely important, probably the most important thing I'm really going to say is really up front, the notion of a counterfactual. Okay, what is that? When one is talking about policy, all right, the conceptual framework has to be paired with what? All right, because you have the world as it is, you say there's a problem, all right, and you're going to have to then compare what the policy is going to do with if you didn't do anything, all right? Seems simple enough, and there's a nice popular culture uh, uh, illustration of what a counterfactual is. It's the film that everybody sees a hundred times during Christmas. It's called It's a Wonderful Life, all right? And Jimmy Stewart gets to perform, gets to experience, if you will, the counterfactual, right? What life would be like had he not been born, okay? That's what a counterfactual is. So he sees how life is as has been through his, his existence and the problems that exist uh, that he thinks he has caused. And then he gets to see what happens if he weren't alive. Okay? That's, in a sense, how you want to do policy analysis. You want to see what would the world be like right, if we didn't have the policy. 
and then what would the world be like if we did? And effectively then what you're doing, what's the science of this? You're holding all other events constant. All right, so you're just isolating what the policy is doing. That's the science of all of this. That's what we're, you know, get training to do. Students have to go through People who assess it have to go through this. Because obviously, there are many countervailing forces, and you can interpret a policy as doing something when it wasn't doing that at all. You can say it was a bad policy when, in fact, it wasn't its fault. Or you could say it's a good policy and it really wasn't responsible for doing that. Okay? So the counterfactual is extremely important. All right? And the difficulty, of course, the counterfactuals are very rare because you don't really observe the world with and without the policy in real time. Does happen, but very rare. So you have to sort of this hypothetical word compare it to the actual world, and that's how we really do all these sorts of things. And it's extremely important. Anytime you hear anybody saying, you know, this policy is doing this, we're responsible for that. If you can see them in person, say, what's the counterfactual? They'll think you're really smart, by the way, if you say that. <laughs> <laughs> and then listen to what they're saying. Okay, and obviously if you're in front of the TV, at least then yourself thinking, what exactly is the counterfactual? You know, when the president says the stimulus program has done X, Y, and Z, you say, so, well, suppose we didn't do it, what would have happened? <coughs> then you're starting to think like an economist and you may then want to rethink if that's how you want to start thinking. Okay, <laughs> so that, that's what this is uh, about conceptually. As I said, we want to build on evidence and start identifying common themes so we don't always start from square one. That's what's so frustrating about a lot of the discussions. It's as if we've never done this before, all right? And obviously the media will present things that way. In other words, you know, we're going to talk about fuel economy. Well, hello, you know, we've been talking about fuel economy for many decades, right? You know, you can name every issue. It's like we're starting from square one. Do we know anything about it? Well, I don't know. Why should we even care? You know, it's a new issue. We're going to talk about it from the very beginning. All right, so specifically then, what, what are the kinds of areas then if we want to go into market failure, okay? So obvious one is monopoly, and that's what we mean by market power in input or output markets. So output is, is the monopoly, so they're selling things and there's inefficiencies associated with monopoly, okay? And the policy we have is competition policy, antitrust policy to try to deal with monopoly. Uh, input markets, monopsony, so you have one buyer, okay, and um, the way we actually tend to deal with that is allow for collective bargaining, so I'm really not going to go into that one. That seems to, to, to deal with that problem. Okay, second is what we call natural monopoly. A natural monopoly is a, is a special monopoly. It arises from a, a rather unusual technological characteristic in how the firm produces the product, and that unusual production characteristic is that costs continue to decline as it produces more units. If that's the case, that is called a natural monopoly. All right? Now that's a cool thing. The more you produce, cheaper it is. The problem with, with it is that if you have competition, it can be almost sort of cutthroat. And the firms can undercut each other to the point where either you're all out of business or one survives and then they become a monopoly, all right? So the justification for regulation is to deal with the problem of natural monopoly, all right? Otherwise, we have, have market failure. Okay, the big one, which is totally relevant for, for today's crisis, is imperfect, imperfect information. Okay? There are many different forms where imperfect information can come about, but the basic idea is obviously the seller knows something about the product that you don't, and because of that, you can, quote, get ripped off. All right? Or there are things that you know, both of you are not sure about, but with some efforts that the you know, party could provide, public information that could help. Okay, so there we have inefficiencies in that what you think you're getting and the utility or benefits you're getting from it is not going to be what you expect it to be. All right? So we'll go, go into that a lot. Okay, externalities. Okay, these can be good things or bad things. Externalities are classic ones is co or congestion. Okay, that is, your happiness or satisfaction is affected by the actions of others in a negative way. So pollution, a firm pollutes, okay, damages the environment, affects your health. Okay, that's your classic negative externality. Okay, positive externality is what this university is all about. You didn't realize that. It's an externality. Producing public knowledge, R&D, 
right? The idea is, is you're going to be doing this for the better of mankind. You can't really, I write a paper, you know, it's something that anybody can benefit from, I wish. But, um, <laughs> yeah, that's what we're trying to do here. And you want to then promote that kind of thing, okay? So government's good if it's really subsidizing academic research because it's bettering better, uh, mankind. Positive externality. Okay. Not surprisingly, that's one area where all academics, except for Milton Friedman, tend to agree. <laughs> More money for universities to promote R&D. Okay. Public goods is the last one. But public goods is, is what's called, uh, formally, I like to think of it more as public production. That there are certain uh, services or products that may be privately unprofitable, okay, that you really could never do this as a private entity, but it would be publicly profitable to do this. Okay, public transit example. From a social point of view, it may be desirable because those benefits from buses, including the benefits to users and, let's say, reducing congestion, would justify the social production of this good. And if we just allow it to do it, we won't have it. All right. So then government would come in, and either they would subsidize the operations, or, the, or what usually happens, they produce them themselves. Okay? So public production is, is another area where we could have market failure. All right. Now, the question is, though, in practice, how effective has the government been in addressing all of these issues? Okay? So you see where I'm going. You're going to get pretty soon the punchline. <laughs> all right. So first thing we want to know, and then the research is, you know, is there just evidence of market failure? So, you know, economists just do empirical work and say, you know, is there some social cost? Provided uh, that, that's been generated from a particular industry because of the presence of monopoly. Okay, has that really been a problem? Okay, and usually in practice it's rare that we have one firm, say maybe two, and so the concern is market power, anti-competitive -com behavior causing problems, okay, that are, that are of a serious systematic nature. Okay, or is there really imperfect information out there uh, that is causing problems for consumers in, in, in their... Uh, uh, consumption and choice of, of goods. Okay. Then the, the big pic picture question, well, okay, fine, there may be problems, but is government policy doing anything about it? You know, what's the evidence that government policy is actually improving performance? Okay, so there is you want to do your counterfactual analysis. You want to see what the world would have been like if government didn't do anything and compare it with the world that exists because government has now gotten involved and tried to address the problem. And then finally, Okay, it may be improving things, but can we even get government to do better? Is it optimal? Okay, that is, we have benchmarks and what the most desirable outcome could be. Sort of the thing about economics, that gives us the science, you know, mathematical part is optimization is what we call it. So making the best of things. We can do better, but can we do best, so to speak? And so what you want to try to do is come up with policies that are actually ways of improving resource allocation. Okay. All right, bottom line now, at least now before the crisis, okay? This was a lot better before that damn crisis. <laughs> One, interventions often are unnecessary. So certainly in a world of anecdotes, we can see motivation for government getting involved. But remember, we want to look at data, not just anecdotes. Anecdotes are cool and entertaining, but in the end, you know, how systematic really is the problem. And what my conclusion is oftentimes intervention is unnecessary. That, in fact, even though every once in a while there, there, there are difficulties, you know, there's no justification for getting involved. The, the, the costs, the social costs are just too small. Okay. Secondly, yes, there are problems, uh, but government isn't doing anything about them. So th there are missed opportunities. Things could have been done. The market is by no means perfect. This is not a sort of a, a uh, free market uh, pro-free market uh, talk on everything. Yes, there are such a thing as market failure. No question about that. I don't think anyone reasonable you know, could disagree with that. Yes, unreasonable people do disagree with that. Point. Okay. Then, the, you know, my conclusion at this point is that a lot of these areas where there was alleged market failure to justify government intervention turn out really not to be market failure, but because government is involved, they're actually costs that the government is creating 
and it would be better to get them out of the game and allow the market to try to improve matters than they could. Okay. So this really sort of you know, told the story of, in fact, you know, government is doing more harm than good. And for that matter, yeah, there are problems out there, but none of them are so serious uh, that a lot of government intervention is justifiable. All right. The mood of the country, at least in, in certain quarters, is that you know, the financial crisis is just it exposed a fundamental flaw, as you hear these kind of statements, in capitalism. Um, and this is a broken model. And the, quote, free market ideology is misguided. And we need to rethink completely everything that we've been doing. And you know, we've been sold you know, a bad story uh, by Adam Smith and, and his followers. And my response is, well, empirical evidence might help your argument. And at least in terms of the evidence I gathered, uh, it's, it's grossly overstated, to put it mildly. Okay. All right, now, a slight modification uh, given the crisis. All right, a serious market failure in perfect information did occur, and this really caused the economic crisis. So, you know, attacking Greenspan and the Fed as the, quote, prime mover of the crisis is ridiculous. I mean, this began as a micro problem of imperfect information, all right, in terms of risk, and assessments of, 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 of risk involved in housing and the, and the view, even one that I held, um, for a short while anyway, that housing prices would never go down, uh, turned out to be wrong. And that was a bad bet. <laughs> and there's no way to get around that. All right? And it started there. All right? Now, you can tell all sorts of stories about interest rates or whatever, but nonetheless, people were ready to put their money on that wheel. And that wheel just didn't turn out the way they thought it would. All right, but my main point that I've been, been saying is I think the, the general backlash against markets and broad claims that this is now exposing you know, how bad markets are in, in so many different areas, I think is, is misleading and I think may lead to counterproductive policies. And I'll, I'll mention some examples of that, too. All right, so as, as the sort of free market side seems softened, then people say, yeah, now let's have more government intervention. But is that really going to help? OK. My main concern is the lack of evidence about the efficacy of government intervention and how effective in the end we can really count on government to prevent these crises. Now, this may make you nervous. Am I saying that, is it, are we going to have this again? We'll have something like it. But you know, that's just the way human beings are. I mean, I tend to look at, as a microeconomist, that the economy is made up of individuals. We have ups and downs, we take chances, so on and so forth. Uh, but we also are robust, and I think that the robustness is things that I like to stress rather than just the concerns of, of, of these failures. Now, of course, I'm employed, or better yet, I've never had a job in my life, so it's easy for me to say that. But uh, you know, nonetheless, I think this is just the, the, the nature of, of how a market uh, economy is going to work. All right, so again, this is just a summary of the approaches. I think we've already covered this. What we're doing basically is cost-benefit analysis. So obviously, you have to have a sense of what the costs and the benefits of these things are. That's something that's much easier to do in micro than macro. Again, the counterfactual, I'm going to focus more on academic stuff in all of this. Part of this really was an academic enterprise to expose, frankly, to the profession many areas where we actually have quite limited knowledge. So this, at the one hand, I'm trying to extol the virtues of research. At sometimes, at the same other time, I'm also trying to expose the weaknesses in the enterprise, that there was just a lot that, even in my area, we still don't know and we need more work. So hopefully, it can be used to, to spur a, additional areas. Generally, I was surprised, and this is sort of back on the, the, pol the political part of it. In micro, Oftentimes, you don't really quite tend to see the obvious major divisions that we do see in macro. I really, if, if, if you actually look at my manuscript uh, available on the web for free, um, that there wasn't a lot of division between the so Generally, we, it was easy to me to come to consensus with the available work that was out there, especially when it was my work. Um, <laughs> but you know, that, that said, you know, there tended to be you know, a, a, a surprising 
de degree of agreement among economists who are notoriously ridiculed for you know, being on the one hand and the other. Um, so I, th I think that was good. But as I said, more work is, is clearly needed in this area. So those are undergrads and graduates. I'm, I'm suggesting there are a lot of doctoral dissertations still out there. All right, so now I'm going to the specifics of uh, where the areas of market failure are, are and probably uh, we'll go quicker through some than others. Uh, and then you know, we can talk more about the ones that you're most interested in. All right, so market power, this is antitrust policy. Now, this one frankly surprised me. You know, again, I was really trying to learn with you know, some priors in some areas, but other areas thinking, oh, you know, I think maybe government intervention should be OK. And this was certainly one of them that I thought was OK. You know, areas of what we call monopolization. So firms can be prosecuted for abusing market power. It is not against the law to be a monopolist. If you're just better than everybody and you succeed, you know, that's OK. All right. The problem is, is that you do things uh, that are harmful and anti-competitive. Um, that can be deemed as illegal behavior and lead to prosecution. Collusion which you'd think would be a pretty open and shut one. You know, firms get together, agree on prices. And I trust authorities in bringing cases a long time for collusive behavior. Mergers, there the issue is when firms agree to consolidate, are they actually then in the process of doing that, creating anti-competitive behavior, anti-competitive situations of getting more market power? So, you know, if two big firms, they agree to merge, and then you've just basically created a strong monopolist, and there's no efficiency gains. So when I looked at really the evidence of assessing this, these actions and government's efforts, I found very little in terms of hard evidence that demonstrated that government intervention actually generated gains to consumers. Now, one big qualification is something that I could not assess, and that's deterrence. All right. I could not sort of see if we had no antitrust authorities at all what the world would be like. I'm just looking at those areas where they tried to do something. You know, did we actually see then retrospective benefits to consumers? Okay, the deterrent stuff, I can't really document one way or the other. The way that that is done is international comparisons. So when we'll look at antitrust policies in the US, which will be stricter than other countries, and sort of see, OK, has that made a difference in performance? All right, And even there, you know, the, the performance, at least of our antitrust authorities, was wanting or lacking, if you will. So even across the line, just going through the evidence, you know, I really could see very little. And you know, published this work and have gotten lots of criticisms for it, but one major criticism has been absent studies that actually demonstrate empirically the benefits from antitrust intervention in these areas. Now, despite that, update. Very early on, we have an appointment of Christine Varney, who worked for a law firm, and I'm sure that law firm is quite happy. She's now in a new position. She's <laughs> head of the department. She's got a lot of work. There's got to be the other side. Uh, and now the department's going to plan to restore, over, over, overcome the Bush doctrine, uh, not in the Palin sense of what the Bush doctrine is, but <laughs> a different Bush doctrine, uh, and have an aggressive enforcement policy against corporations that abuse market dominance. Question is, you know, is this going to be an effective strategy? You know, what is it that's motivating this in the first place? All right, so what ideally one would like to see is you know, estimates of what we call deadweight losses, or losses to consumers you know, from monopoly, high monopoly prices, or just anti-competitive prices. What's really motivating this? You know, is the problem with consumer welfare in America that we just pay too much for everything we buy in relation to the cost of producing it? You know, it's an empirical question. All right? It's something that could be measured, it could be demonstrated, and then one can sort of point to, OK, here are the potential sources of where the problems exist. You know, we have these industries, we only have a few firms, and these firms just dominate the marketplace, and they don't compete with each other. And because of that, they're able to get away with these high prices. Where's the evidence for that? All right? And that's what we want to be looking at. And you know, instead of sort of having this populist rally against firms, you know, are you then just going to be harassing them, and really nothing's really going to come out of it? All right? Now, this is even surprising 
collusion. You might think, oh, how hard can it be? You catch somebody colluding, you prosecute them, shouldn't the prices come down? You'd think, <laughs> take a look at one case, auction case, Sotheby's and Christie's, caught red-handed, which is pretty much the way, actually, you got to do it, right? Ag agreeing on colluding on uh, commission fees and whatever. They prosecute them, they don't contest it, they're guilty, and the damn fees haven't changed at all. <laughs> that's the thing that's sort of disconcerting, all right? And in general, you know, look at the Microsoft case. What was that about? I mean, why did we go through all that? I don't know really what they've done or what's so different after years of a prosecution and then a remedy. You know, cut them up in two, cut them up in three. It was just weird. And I think that is sort of the concern with a lot of this stuff. Systematically, what is going on? We have long cases. It's not clear what the remedy is going to be. And then in retrospect, we ask ourselves, what have we really got for all this? Okay. Now, there may be more evidence that's out there, and later scholars will say, look, there's been real be benefits. It just hasn't been measured before. That's all fine. All I'm suggesting is this is the kind of thing systematically that we want to develop. All right. And before some you know, important policymaker says, here, we're going to have a, a change in course in policy, it would be nice if there'd be a foundation for why we're doing what we're doing and some reasonable analysis or before the fact uh, estimate of what kind of gain we're going to get. Okay? And this is going to come up as, as I go on. Yes, please. Good question. Okay, I've been admittedly simplifying it and sort of focusing on in terms of how we, we think about consumer welfare, we think in terms of prices, and that is certainly not true. Obviously, product quality is extremely important. So in general, then, a concern of anti-competitive behavior is actually joint costs, if you will, of not only higher prices but reduced quality. And improvements in competition lead to lower prices, improvements in quality, but probably more importantly, innovation. Okay. So, yes, when one does these kinds of, of studies, ideally one wants to try to measure quality, product quality. And that's a bit of an amorphous concept. So in specific areas, you've got to be very careful how you're going to be doing that. But just to give you one preview of where there was a successful government policy. It was called deregulation. And in particular, the area really that I focus on in transportation, the areas of quality that were improved dramatically in a number of the industries were in service time. Railroads, for example, were an industry where before deregulation, you'd call them up and say, where's my shipment? They say, your guess is as good as mine. Uh, <laughs> When am I going to get it? Again, let's start flipping coins. You know, obviously, then reliability and some measure of what we call variance or standard deviation is something you could look at. Okay, how many days would it take you to get the thing? And then in a given market, what was the variation around the mean in those number of days? Okay. So this is something that you could actually measure and sort of see that in terms of product quality, in this case, service time, you got improvements in deregulation. All right. uh, yes and no, right? Because when, when you think about rail, its loss in market share came about because of its inability to compete effectively in time with truck, right? It was actually, rail is a less costly mode, costs less oftentimes in production versus truck. But the speed and reliability of trucks, especially with obviously the benefits of the highway system, you know, gave it a strong competitive advantage. All right. So in that case, it depends on what we call the consumer's value of time. So consumers have a value of money, but you also have value time and reliability. In those areas where that value is very high, that can be an extremely powerful force in competition and, and can affect, obviously, the performance of, of the industry. Certainly, that obviously is now becoming a, an important issue in developments of information technology. A lot of those 
benefits really are, quote, quality benefits in terms of time. You know, how long do you have to sit in front of your internet to, you know, to, to get a particular uh, website, that kind of thing. Yeah. So, you're using a counterfactual compare, but you're comparing two things at two different times. So there's an assumption that we did something and things improved or got worse. So there's a modeling assumption here, things are being steady or not. Okay. In the analysis. Okay, so the question that's being raised actually is, is, is a more detailed analytical question. Of, okay, how do you actually you perform counterfactuals? How do you actually do these? Okay. One way, and this is a nice way of doing it, would be at the same point in time, you know, compare different areas with different policies. So the, the, the wonderful thing is we have states. So we can do laboratory experiments by comparisons across states. And to the extent we have variations in policies across states, we can see major differences in performance. And that's basically really what happened in terms of motivating the justification for deregulation. We had what we call intrastate regulation and intrastate deregulation. In this case, airlines is, is, is an example. So California and Texas, they deregulated their airlines intrastate. You fly Los Angeles, San Francisco. Uh, basically, it was a, a market determined price. So, in the 1960s, you looked at so those prices and compared them with interstate airline fares between Boston and Washington, D.C., and we noticed the California fares were much lower, distance was comparable, service quality the same. What's going on? Well, it's regulatory policy. So, you, that's one example of how you do it. You can do this, obviously, in telecommunications, electricity. It's all about those in, you know, state comparisons where we have different areas of regulatory reform. Um, you, know, you can think of, uh, obviously, depending on your area, other ways we can construct such a laboratory. Okay. Alternatively, you have the more challenging problem that usually comes up, and it's the time series. You're separated in time uh, in terms of when you had the policies. So in that case, you actually then have to literally perform the counterfactual statistically. You'll have an actual outcome, and you'll have to go from the earlier outcome in the different policy area and project up what would have happened. Okay? So you have to use some statistical analysis to try to control for all the things that would have interfered with that outcome that have nothing to do with the policy. All right? And that is obviously our fundamental problem today when any time the president speaks about what, let's say, the stimulus package is doing, you know, we're seeing things something over time. Okay? We're not, nothing is held constant, so to speak. This is the, the science of it, holding things constant, isolating what's going on. And obviously, you know, who knows really what the stimulus package is doing. Right? Many things are changing. Right? Nothing's hold, holding constant. I don't even know where the stimulus package money is going. Well, actually, I do. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm getting lots of it where I live. <laughs> And I just saw what you're getting here in this state. You're getting nothing compared to what we're getting. <laughs> All right, but that's really what one has to do, is, is you can't just pick the two points in time. You have to pick the two points in time and then project from that earlier point. Now, that raises questions in and of itself. You say, well, you know, may there have been learning during that time that changed, quote, the parameters that you're assuming are held constant. Maybe. That's what the science is about. I don't make this point to say it's complicated, I make this point to say it's too complicated just to listen to what politicians and media people say. These are hard things to do, but everybody's ready to weigh in on all this stuff, all right? Even people who have a lot of practice of doing it, you need to be humble, all right? Because doing these things is really hard. The issues seem easy, and it's so obvious what we ought to do. Yeah, tell me about it. You know, try to actually then demonstrate it rigorously and empirically in a way that's persuasive Good luck, all right? And so I think it, it urges caution, but I think the way we usually try to do these things in a, quote, non, in a, in a science that doesn't really have controlled experiments is we look at the cumulative evidence. So we do these counterfactuals. You, know, you make your assumption, I'll make mine, and let's start, you know, seeing, doing different things, different data, different assumptions. If we start converging to similar outcomes, then we can start speaking about truth with quotes. We're getting there. That's what we ought to be doing. All right, so that's a quick blurb on that. All right, now, this I can go through quickly. 
you know, the, the notion of, of natural monopoly, this was our justification for regulating all these industries. But there's something we learned from this. There's a difference between technological scale economy. So this really rare thing, the more you produce, the cheaper it is. You, know, you think at some point things are going to start going up because you have some manager. That's the problem. That's why we, you know, the, the, the fun ends. It's cheaper, cheaper, cheaper. cheaper. But again, it's so big, some CEO has got to then run it and you know, he'll mess it up and try to get bigger and whoop, costs are going up. <laughs> right? That's the idea. All right? So rarely happens. But what we then began to see that was happening is these were induced by actually the regulations. So in a sense, it was a self-fulfilling prophecy. We think railroads have scale economies, but then we regulate them, don't allow them to adjust their operations. Okay, so when the trucks come along and compete with them and start taking business, what's going to happen? Well, they're going to operate with lower output at that point where it's really high cost. Yes, it is true. If they produced more output, costs would go down. But hello, you're preventing them from doing it because you're not letting them compete effectively. So in fact, what we see are regulatory induced scale economies. This happens actually quite regularly in the areas of bus transportation. So buses are, but, uh, public ownership of buses is justified on the grounds too. That buses have scale economies. Okay, so what do we have? We have in major cities these 60 seat buses, you know, with four people in them, right, during the peak too. But forget about that. All right, so we say, well, it's a natural monopoly. If we had more people in them, you know, the cost would go down. Yeah, how about this for a policy? Allow the bus to change bus sizes. Wouldn't that be a better way to do it? Instead of running with big buses, sometimes they've got to go with little buses. Well, no, we don't really want them to do that. Well, then you're just inducing scale economies. If they could adjust their equipment you know, to try to match the people with the buses, then they'd really be full. What's an example of an industry that's doing that? Airlines. Have you ever been in a flight now that has any seats left? <laughs> Now, there's another question there, how an industry that fills all its seats still can't make any money, but <laughs> maybe tomorrow we'll talk about that one. All right, so the, the traditional area of industry scale economies, I think that's sort of gone. You know, what we're left with is agricultural subsidies, quotas and tariffs are areas of what we call economic regulation. But obviously this is, this is total politics, right? I mean, Forget about all the reasons that we know that the agri agricultural subsidies aren't just anymore. We basically now have an industry that's actually doing quite well in terms of economic terms and you compare with other industries. You know, tariffs, again, you know, we're always going to be at that. Um, so there we have that. <laughs> all right. Now, this is the important one, obviously, for the current situation, imperfect information. Okay. Now, one of the things that we're going to learn and where this is all going is that there may be market failures at certain point in times, but we get changes in technology and behavior that can overcome them. All right. False advertising. I mean, anybody now, right, who gets sort of lured in on false advertising, come on, check the internet. <laughs> right? I mean, it, it's sort of embarrassing. I mean, yeah, there are ways now of getting sort of reasonable information about most products, I mean, through all sorts of things, all right? So I think advertising can be useful as information. You know, the extent of, inf of evidence we have on false advertising causing huge welfare losses is generally rare and increasingly rare is obviously the world is getting hooked up uh, on the web and other places. You know, product disclosure, potential problems certainly. Uh, Safety standards are one way we want to deal with you know, issues of uncertainty about information on these kinds of things. Um, workplace safety, all areas. Let me just show you a few things. Okay, this was an old one that I have. Concerns about toy injuries. You know, we had a crisis at one time where we were getting toys from China and people were playing with them getting hurt. But you know, we didn't ever see anything systematic about sort of the injury rate. As much as we could get from uh, consumer product safety, you know, it tended to bound around a bit, but it wasn't quite clear whether we had a fundamental problem. I'm going to move on a bit, but I'll get back. 
Okay. Here we see now occupational injuries going down. All right. So here we have an area where we have occupational uh, uh, safety uh, interventions in terms of workplace safety inspections and what have you, and we see sort of things getting getting safer over time. Okay. What sort of you know, the interpretations that we're going to give to that? So here we have an area. Just the descriptive data don't seem to indicate much of a problem. But here we have something where things are getting better, where we do have a government intervention in terms of OSHA. Okay. Well, I think here again is the example of the counterfactual. Okay. In the case of the toys, it turns out, well, we only had one toy tester. So what could one absolutely really expect in terms of product safety? You know, there really wasn't anybody doing any of these things when we actually took a close look at this agency. You know, it was just sort of embarrassing. I mean, things were just going to be flooding the market. I haven't said anything about OSHA here, but there are obvious other reasons why we might see improvements in the safety record of companies. You don't tend to become profitable killing your employees, <laughs> right? With greater competition, one would, might, might expect that, sure enough, we see improvements in productivity and getting down the accident rate is one of them. Now, another thing is, you know, closer look at what OSHA was doing, we found real problems in looking at systematic stories of what they were doing and how it actually affected behavior at the workplace in terms of identifying, like, here are the machines that are hurting people. They didn't tend to do that. You know, they just had sort of broad inspections. So even though we saw something going down, when people have actually then tried to isolate what the effect of OSHA regulations were, they couldn't find anything. Okay? And I think there were a lot of market-driven stories as to, to, to what reasons why we saw these kinds of improvements. Okay. Big problem now is one certainly in housing. They really, no question, buyers and investors just didn't properly weight the credit risks they were assuming. Um, we did have regulatory interventions. It's not like people were, you know, couldn't have helped. Banks, rating agencies were a big problem, and this is going to be something that will be looked at. We did have agencies that could have helped. Now, one of the concerns that an economist, uh, Larry White, has written about extensively is the rating agencies themselves are subject to regulation that has basically created a cozy oligopoly that really isn't effective as it could be in terms of really rating these things appropriately, and that we needed a more competitive rating agency uh, industry to help. Okay? Now, see, note here that I point out that most of the defaults were centered in regulated financial institutions that purchased these things, or even Bernie Madoff's operations were subject to federal regulation. Again, you, you, you may have even heard something about this. You know, the, the SEC you know, talking about, well, what went wrong in Madoff, in, their evaluation of Madoff's operations, and there was somebody who said, look, I've been screaming about him forever, and you know, I just could never get anywhere with it. All right, so you know, I think what we see in mixing these is that in some cases, there did not really appear to be a systematic problem. In other cases, things seem to improve, like OSHA, but it's hard to identify really what the agency did. And in others, yes, we had a very serious problem that developed, even though there are certainly very strong parts where regulation could have and should have played a role and didn't. All right, that's our concern now. Is yes, growing concerns of market failure and imperfect information, but what these agencies and what financial regulatory reform is going to do about it? Now, I'm not an expert again in the, in the financial area, but that's the thing that I'm going to be looking for. Is something that really says. We're going to have some agency that's going to do this. It's not going to be one toy tester. You know, it's not going to be some agency that goes into a couple of plants and looks around and says, that eh, seems clean enough, or you know, how does that machine work? It's something that's systematically going to sort of find a way that's going to prevent these kinds of information problems. I just don't see it. And I think that's really the challenge that, that we're going to try to have if we're going to get policy reform that really is going to be effective as opposed to sort of doing something because, well, the public calls for action. Well, fine. Is it really going to mount to anything? Okay, I'm open to it, but you know, I want to see the evidence. All right. Okay, plenty of time. Okay, so consumption externalities then are one, as I said, 
where people engage in economic activities, consumption, and they cause cost to others. So when you drive, create emissions, okay, and obviously this is expanding to, to global warming and, and concerns about that. Aircraft, you live near McCarran, you hear noise, not a good thing. And obviously smoking and drinking has its problems associated with it. Now, here's an interesting case where we do see that we've had interventions, regulations, in terms of what they call command and control policy. So one way that economists like to deal with externalities is put a price on it. Okay? So you can go ahead and do what you're going to do, smoke, drive, whatever, but we want to attach a price to you doing that that reflects the social costs of your activity. All right, so if you're, if you're going to drive, we want some sort of emissions tax. Okay, discourage you from doing that. Create congestion, fine, tolls, or that kind of thing. You can get a quantity-based solution, right? If you have the price right, there's got to be a quantity that goes along with it. You can get a quantity-based policy, say you will produce this amount of emissions, and that is it. Okay, and your engine has to be built to be able to do that. All right, so that would be then a command and control type of policy. So we see actually that we have seen significant environmental improvement. All right, so that seems to be the good thing. Problem is, what was the cost of achieving that? Remember, the heart of our assessment is both costs and benefits. Okay, and the big concern in this area has been we've had to pay a very large amount for the benefits that we have received. And this is really going to spill over to global warming. Yes, this is a very, very serious problem, but we've got to be very careful about a policy that's going to address it at very, very high costs. Right? Obviously, if you want to eliminate pollution, just don't have people drive, period. Well, fine. What's that going to do for production in this country? Right? Uh, you want to get rid of congestion? Fine. You know, you can't drive during such and such times. Yeah, you'll get rid of congestion all right. You won't have anybody going anywhere, right? So that's what extreme cases. I think the problems that we have had with pollution is that people who have studied these things find that the benefits from reducing pollution have basically been offset by very high costs of actually achieving these gains. Okay. Here's an example also where, in the case of aircraft noise, okay, we have seen improvements actually in requiring planes to have ways of reducing the noise created by your engine. Either you have a hush kit that you put on the engine or you actually go out and build one that's, that's quieter. So we see reductions in exposure to noise. Problem is, is this is going to make the plane much more expensive and actually makes some of them obsolete. Okay, since this is like cash for clunkers, right? We're sort of making the clunkers obsolete and we're not even allowing people who might want to buy them and could, and those are the kind of cars they could afford, even buy them, we're actually now you know, trashing them, so to speak. Um, that's very costly to do something like that. And we want to be weighing costs and benefits, again, if we're concerned with economic efficiency. Okay. And this was here our problem with noise. Um, yes, we, we reduced noise exposure, but at a very high price. And one thing that also has to be considered, just in a preview in, in some of the things I'm going to say at the end, is how consumers respond to this. That is, one way of, deal, of the market's approach to dealing with externalities is have people make adjustments. Those people who do not like these externalities will obviously try to stay away from, but those who don't mind them as much will make adjustments. And in an extreme, Logan Airport is in Boston, and on the flight path, not surprisingly, almost an optimal market adjustment is located, a school of the deaf. <laughs> so you know, these are the kinds of things. You're going to have lower property values, but here you have, you know, some kind of entity that obviously is not going to have this problem. People who obviously live on the flight path over McCarran, I'm sure, are going to be paying lower prices. Well, everybody pays low prices now here, but uh, <laughs> that won't be forever. All right, so those are the kinds of what we call adjustments that, that consumers can make to actually reduce the cost of, of externalities. 
And at the same time, one concern is that policies that try to adjust them, people will actually then readjust. You make vehicle driving safer or anything safer, what's going to happen? People will take more risks. All right? So you can get things going in other ways, too. Ways that the market tries to minimize these costs and that ways that, quote, you'll see market or behavioral responses to efforts by the government to try to address them, people will make other adjustments. Okay, this is, comes under the broad heading of these unintended consequences. So when people see concerns about policies because of unintended consequences, this is what they're talking about. That there are, quote, responses by individuals that either are really trying to solve these problems already and you're getting in their way, or once these policies are in place, people are going to do things that you haven't anticipated. Okay. All right, so <clears throat> in the area of production, we get a similar set. Air pollution, factories produce the air, uh, emissions trading has been a policy there, water pollution, super fun for, for hazardous waste, that kind of thing. A variety of areas where we do have production externalities. Sorry. So here is an example where we've had to try to address water pollution. This is probably something of interest here, and we really haven't seen the kind of improvements. So in contrast to studies that looked at air improvements, in the case of water, even with efforts to, to have command and control policies, we actually haven't seen the improvements that we would have liked to have seen in, in terms of even descriptive data. Okay, updates. So here's another area now where the market all along has been failing. I think there are examples now. We can't deny there have been failures in, in externalities. It's an area that's been unsuccessful. But again, have we seen positive steps the government's really done? And does that make justification? Well, you know, immediately we want to move to sort of raising corporate average uh, fuel economy standards, what they call CAFE, okay? And this is one that involves a lot of trade-offs. Yes, you'll get better fuel economy. What's going to happen? People will drive more, potentially offset that policy, all right? To get that, you may have smaller cars that could affect vehicle safety, okay? So on and so forth. All right, so lots of various concerns in terms of responses. Overall, you know, what I think we've been looking for in the research area is something that does a very careful and comprehensive cost-benefit assessment that could actually justify immediately raising these fuel economy standards, but that wasn't done. You know, this was something that was immediately taken into place, and the administration said, we're going to raise them. Okay? Cash for conquest, obviously, is something we've gone in. Already there's one study that's come out. The cost of this you know, greatly exceeded the benefits uh, in terms of what we had to pay for these kinds of things. Um, I found this policy, though, quite interesting in a different way. A couple of years before the crisis, both Ford and GM were very aggressive in offering incentives for their cars. I don't know if people remember, but you can get incentives anywhere on the order from like four to $7,000 to buy new Fords and, and GMs. And they did very little for market share. What was interesting about cash for clunkers is that if you looked at the total incentives, they basically were about the same that, the comp that at least the American companies were offering in terms of the discounts from their cars. But there was one big difference. The difference was actually how you were going to get it. That is, you'd be able to get it for your old used car. And here was a case where you saw a difference between value in use and value in exchange. That is, consumers said, look, if I try to sell this thing, I'll get $1,000 for it. But I think it's worth more because it's certainly worth a lot more to me. I can use it for personal transportation. I could never get anything of this use for 1000 bucks. The government wants to now give me 5000 for it. That's what I think it's worth. I'm willing now to do it, but I wasn't willing to take 5000 directly from the dealer, which is kind of an interesting behavioral thing. All right. It turns out, if this is really how people are thinking, consider what we could do in the housing market. People are really stubborn about housing prices when they put their house on the market, right? They say, mine's worth 700 all right, you know, maybe things have gone down, but I don't want to, I don't want to lower that. And I don't particularly like paying 6% to the realtor, all right? But what happens if that's really how people are behaving? Well, the housing market is then slow to clear. 
My recommendation is if the government was going to intervene in anything, it should have been housing. They should have said, instead of cash for clunkers, you know, some equivalent for, you know, we will pay the realtor, we'll pay the 6%. And if you look at the average house price in this country, wouldn't it cost that much more for house than cash for clunkers, but it would have been something that I think would have, would have gotten a market moving that we needed to, to get moving. And I just said that, but, you know, there you have it. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know anything about the housing market either, but, you know, too bad. I'm talking, so there you go. All right. <laughs> Cap and trade, yeah. Are you saying that would, that would incentivize people to sell the homes? I think, yes. I think that, that would, my, my hope would be that if we had a program like this, they would be more willing to, say, actually offer lower prices. Because what happens is they'll, they'll charge a price, keep a price on it, and they'll keep it on there for months and months and months before they lower the damn thing. Just committed. These are, I'm not talking about people who are in a foreclosure situation or people you know, are forced to sell. I'm talking about a situation where they just put it on the house, put their house on the market, and they say, we're just not going to lower the thing. At least here in Las Vegas, it doesn't, it doesn't look like, at least to me, that the supply of homes is the problem. I mean, it seems like to me, at least here, there, there are ample homes on the market and current at, at a low price. No, but you want the market to clear. That's what I'm saying. It's the excess supply. So in other words, if you sell the home, then the new guy, then the guy who sells his home, then he's got to go out and buy another one. That's what I want that guy back on. The, I want that guy now buying a home. That's what I want to have happen. Right? I want him to get, you know, get the things moving along. Sell yours and go on and get the other one. Are you saying intervention would be good? Yes. And then, what I'm saying is to the extent we want to do this, all right, and I'm, and I'm realizing that this is going to be costly to do because we're going to give a subsidy. If I was going to give one, I would do it more, and I would prefer to do it in housing and get that market clearing the houses and getting people moving on than I would cash for clunkers. So this is just my editorializing thing. I thought cash for clunkers was a waste of time. We should have been doing it in housing. That has nothing to do with anything, but I just wanted to say it. Yeah. <laughs> the second part of that would have been an incentive to the uh, financial companies to underwrite mortgages because they almost stopped. Um, maybe. I mean, I, all I'm... My point was more that I was struck by the behavior of consumers. That is, sort of their stubbornness in refusing to let go of durable goods that they thought were worth more than the market did, which is always a problem. And so I thought if that behavior carried over into housing, right, that that's something that we might be able to, quote, unstick. You know, what you're saying about financial market, or the mortgage companies may be true, but you know, what I want to just push on is maybe this is a kind of behavior that's sort of interesting and not really appreciated and might have been something that we probably would have acted on that would have done more than what cash for clunkers is going to do. That, that's really all I was getting at there. Okay. All right. Let me, I'm going to conclude. That's what I'm going to do, and then we can talk more. All right. Forget about capital credit. All right. So public production is another area where we have government involvement all right, to take over things. And this can be summed up by the following graphs. Delay continues to go up. And let me point out that as I speak, the Brookings Scholar, who is supposed to come here Monday, has left, and this is a Wednesday. And the reason why he's doing that is because of air travel delay. He doesn't know when he's going to get here. And that problem continues to get worse. All right. Operating assistance for transit, you know, this is you know, a little sore subject or maybe not, all right? And, and I'll put it in print shortly, but bus, rail, and high-speed rail, very, very costly. <laughs> Huge deficits we run and pay for these things, and they're only getting worse. Okay, you know, a source of spending, we'll get to this at the end, for public infra infrastructure. Yeah. Two tiny villages in Alaska getting $28 million for airport funds. I don't think this is going to be doing a lot. Uh, Washington State's using because money. It won't relieve congestion in Seattle. It's spending it out. Money for high-speed rail. Sorry. I'm going to be your worst enemy on that. <laughs> I'll tell you now. You'll get, you'll get high-speed rail from Las Vegas to Nevada, <laughs> Las Vegas to L.A., not if I can write bad editorials about it. 
and this is supposedly a conservative state, how could you even allow this to be up for public discussion? Unconscionable. <laughs> Sorry? Yeah. <laughs> what's, what's the big cost? Does it carry enough people for uh, for a high speed rail? What do you see the big cost of that? You know, why are you so upset at high speed rail? Are there any engineers in the in the in the audience? <laughs> Tell me how much per mile is it going to cost to put in maglev? It's going to go across the fortune. We've got to go over four four thousand foot passes. Let's forget about the fun part. Just the simple technology of a mile of, of track for uh, uh, you know, maglev. It's just incredibly expensive, incredibly expensive. And as I said, we haven't even gotten to the fun part of the, you know, dealing with the getting through mountains and, you know, whatever. Does yes. that work in Japan, though? Does that work in, in Japan? All right, Japan has a couple of advantages, and that's obviously density. All right, I am not really convinced yet in terms of cost and benefit, despite what any might, by, might say about Japan, and for that matter in Europe, really how successful they're doing. But to the extent that there are success stories, you'll get it in a place like that, really where you have the density for it. Okay? So that's obviously going to be the big difference. You know, would you really get the, the traffic density to do it? If we want to do it, in this country, and I would recommend experiments, which is, I think is absolutely critical for all these things. Where I live is where we ought to be doing it. Washington <laughs> to New York, if you will. I'm all for a high-speed rail experiment there, but we all learn to live with our own hypocrisies. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I'm going to talk about a couple of things. Final comments. Yeah. Over here. Yeah. Doesn't that go against your Mount Mega report at, at Brookings where it says the things that are missing is that infrastructure, water, high speed rail, or rail at all? We are landlocked with an automobile or an airplane. So, yeah, of course, the Washington, D.C. area wants it all where they are. But there is an incredible need in one of the fastest growing communities in the country. We don't have rail. I don't care if you call it high speed or mm -hmm. whatever you want to call it, but why, why on earth would we say it's justifiable? in areas in the East Coast where you're railed to death. We have nothing. There's no option here in our community at all to get from point A to point B. And I don't know when the last time was you drove I-15 from Los Angeles to Nevada. Yeah. <laughs> 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 but it's a lot of our moccasins that we are taxpayers. We are one of 50 states and we want rail. <laughs> well, I, I don't know if, if you... <laughs> I, I have, I'll give you, I have two, two responses. The second one's the killer, but I'll give you the first one. <laughs> uh, in terms of my driving on I-15, uh, we were at a meeting today, and John Kasich was mentioning that me, Brittany, and Lindsay Lohan, and uh, whatever, made that drive. So, yeah, I've been there. No. Uh, the, the, the unfortunate response that I have is I had absolutely nothing to do with that report. <laughs> Unfortunately, if you look at that report, that was written by the Metro Center on Economic Studies. Very different. There's no way that any report would have me be supporting of rail in terms of, of what you guys have. The specifics are really, let's do cost benefit, OK? I mean, I'm not aware of any serious cost benefit about rail in Nevada. If you don't have any, and you want to show me you know, some serious cost-benefit work, that's fine. But that's really where this debate has got to be about. Right? Before the fact, I'm pretty confident what I know about the cost of maglev and the kind of passenger densities you're going to get. There's just no way this is going to pass a cost-benefit test. It's not ideology. It really is the engineering and the economics of this just don't make this economically viable. If you have the traffic densities, do it. And obviously, we'll be able to you know, not have to go through how many mountains or whatever <laughs> things you've got to do. And we haven't gotten, by the way, the environmental satisfaction of that you're going to have to go through to get this thing done. You know, that's really what it gets down to. But again, that's area for open research. You know, my prior is that there's just no way you can justify this thing. Okay. Now, of course, you ask about the East Coast, but look who's there. Politicians, right? You know, we, we have more than you in our area for politics. You have other stuff. <laughs> you know, you sound like you're, you, it's not like you're aced out of all this. Yeah. Yeah. When you do cost-benefit analysis and you look at, you know, we kill 45,000 people every year on highways, then you look at how much time we spend driving and just sitting there, the gasoline and the time. 
when you look at everybody's time when you're not moving or when you're driving and not doing anything productive, yeah. then when you compare the train to driving the cars and getting stuck, are you talking about cost-benefit analysis looking at all these issues or just the ticket? No, I think all that's got to be in there. But then there's, there's uh, again, the preview for my next visit, which I'm sure you're looking forward to after this. <laughs> <laughs> What would be the least cost solution to, to improve our highway system? My answer, privatization. But to be continued on that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> All right. What really has gone wrong thus far? You know, in terms of criticisms of markets, I think robustness is something that's underlooked, under, mis, underappreciated, if you will. Yes, things went wrong in the information. But I assure you, people are learning. I'm not saying there won't be information problems in the future, but there'll be different ones. And there'll always be efforts to try to minimize risk and control it much better. That's a good thing. And we're going to learn from doing this. I assure you, I hope in the future that none of you ever buy a house you know, that loses its value 50% or whatever. And you know, we'll have other things. But markets respond in many powerful ways. You know, it's very tough, I assure you, to be in a monopoly. Look, look who's gone under. You know, GM. You know, you know, our big monopolists, of, you know, when I was a child, GM, IBM, AT&T, you know, where are they now, right? And someday someone will be up here giving this, Microsoft, Google, where are they now? I mean, it's, it's, that kind of change is very important in, in uh, having markets respond both to competition, obviously information, there are ways that markets respond, and even externalities, I was trying to point out, there are ways that people can respond, try to improve efficiency. Agencies. You know, a very touchy point is self-selection. Who is it that wants to work as a career in these government agencies? It's not President Obama. You know, he will have grand vision and sound great, but he's not going to be doing the work, right? I mean, it's the toy tester. It's the inspector of OSHA. It's all sorts of things. And you know, they tend to want to have a rather, let's say, relatively unstressful life. And engaging in companies and trying to make these kinds of improvements is extremely stressful. And this is not who wants to self-select and do this kind of work. And so you have very rigid rules. This is how it's going to be. We enforce rules when we can, but we're not going to get into a, lo a lot of stress about doing this kind of stuff. So I think agencies just don't like to change themselves. When things really call for new requirements and have dynamic flexibility, we just don't see it. Oftentimes these policies are in conflict, and of course I haven't even begun to talk about politics. You know, the real question are, politic, are policymakers showing learning. Are they acknowledging, look, here's where we have gone wrong, and here's where we're going to improve, as opposed to the Bush administration did this, and now we're going to do that. All right? And you know, they just didn't do it right, right. Every antitrust authority says, well, they just didn't do it right. right? We're going to do it better. Well, that doesn't show the kind of learning that we'd like to see. You know, what I'd like to see is, yes, we've done cumulative assessments of what's gone on. We see where the mistakes are, and we're going to avoid those mistakes. It really would be nice if we articulated policies that were along those lines. It showed some sort of wisdom, if you will. Obviously, that's something we don't see too often. OK. Updating this, I think I've gone through this a variety of ways. You know, yes, we admit there were market failures in perfect information, but I think government failure is still a problem. And I, I'm not convinced the government's learned. My bottom line, OK. What's somebody here who, obviously, I don't know you exactly who, who what the composition of the audience is, but looking for a layperson, what really should they take away? Yes. Markets make mistakes, sometimes big ones. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous to say you know, free markets are perfect. We do have problems. Does that mean government intervention will improve matters? You know, this is an empirical issue. And you know, thus far, the evidence has not been particularly compelling that government learns, that their interventions are making things better, and that the failure can impose very large costs. And oftentimes, market performance is much better than recognized. Not all deregulation was a disaster. That is, tried, you know, people who oppose financial deregulation, are trying to use it as a dirty word to apply to all deregulation. Well, that's obviously misleading. And it's not even clear to me that deregulation, per se, was the source of the problems in, in the financial markets. Again, I think what we want to have is more retrospective assessments and ultimately accumulation of evidence contributing to truth. The end. More questions in the discussion. <laughs>